Okay, as I can see, the it, it has started. Okay, could you please put a plus in the chat in case you can see me, you can hear me, if everything is okay. Let's wait a couple um, a couple of seconds here to make sure that you can see me. Yeah, see and hear you. Great. Hi. Good day. Good evening. Good good morning. Good afternoon. I don't know what part of the world you are. Just it's very interesting to know. Just put like I know the country where are you from. You know, so we can know each other better, so I can understand where you are watching us from. Okay, Italy, U.S., Latvia, Argentina. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Um, okay. Let Let's start. So I'm Lena. Many people, yeah, from Kenya, Canada. Cool. So uh, let's start. I'm Lena. I am director of customer success here and account management at EOS Data Analytics. My uh, key um, responsibility is to make sure that customers are happy with the services we provide, with the data we provide. And uh, I've been working here almost for more than two years. And I took part in several projects that, I, um, that I'm going to talk about, you know, as ensuring that they are successful. And today we're going to talk particularly about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and neural nets. But from my perspective, from the business perspective, I'll guide you through some real cases that we had uh, in the past uh, to show you how we use neural nets to tackle you know, challenges of forestry, agriculture, and, and uh, other. So yeah, let me guide you. Here we go. So I'll show you how we actually train the data, how we collected ground truth data and see the data, which is most challenging part, uh, how we classified the land cover, how we classified different types of crops. Uh, I'll show you it based on the several examples, how we classified the whole Ukraine. And uh, every year we provide reports and um, map, crop map, where we specified each field agricultural land and what is growing there and how we classify sugar cane and define the areas and meals where it's growing in Brazil. And um, also how we use the neural nets to detect, you know, the deforested areas and uh, or just harvested areas if you're talking about uh, wood management companies, um, not as like something illegal. So yeah. Let me just tell you a couple of words about the company in case you you have never been uh, at our events or you know nothing about the company. So EOS Data Analytics was founded in 2015. Our main focus is uh, improving uh, satellite capabilities to tackle the challenges of the nature, tackle the challenges of the humankind. Uh, our team using modern technology generates inside out of satellite data, weather data, statistical historical data, you know, to translate that down into actionable insights for agriculture, forestry, mining, oil and gas, insurance and finance, and, um, and transportation and some other verticals. But our main focus at the moment is uh, agriculture and forestry. So it's been seven years we've been developing uh, products. For example, uh, till now we have developed three out of box products like crop monitoring, land viewer and forest monitoring. When I'm saying out of box, it means they um, process satellite data on the fly and provide you with already ready-made insights you know that you can use to make some to make decisions based on them. So Land Viewer, this is a platform where you can find satellite data from commercial and open source uh, satellite providers and just analyze satellite imagery and plan different filters, band combinations, indices, and everything. So it's kind of processes them on the fly. Crop monitoring is specifically designed for agriculture, insurance, banking, those who work in the agricultural sector, uh, input suppliers, for example. So it's something that analyzes the data and 
provide you analytics on the crop health, weather data, um, to improve the crop management strategies that you might have. And uh, I'm I'm gonna like show today today the platforms, so you'll you'll see how it look like. And forest monitoring was this is like our the youngest child of our company that was released in 2021. It's still like a lot of to develop there, but it was designed you know to uh, forest to monitor forest cover and um, uh, the the deforested areas using neural nets. So I'm going to show you uh, how it works within today's webinar. Yeah, let's move forward. So I'll, yeah, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat or reach out at sales at eosda.com or uh, if, you, if you want you know, to discuss them personally. Um, I'll be stuck between the slides and sometimes answer your questions. So how do we train neural networks and what challenges the soil? Yeah, if like, um, you know that, uh, or I'll tell you that USDA team consists not only, of, not only from developers, but we do have scientists in, in space um, and agri agri agronomy industry, data scientists, machine learning specialists and GIS specialists and a team of developers, team of researchers. So this is something that makes us completely independent from like, you know, the idea we have to the development of actual product. And um, we've been developing machine learning technology for, for the last seven year, years to eventually transform them into automated pipeline that are easily scalable, scalable and can be applied for different areas um, like in the world that require like you know some small calibration and can be applied at a field level region level or even country level scale and um, i would say that uh, you know like the way machine learning and artificial neural nets work they work pretty much the same as human brain um and they like it's important part of the scientific uh, uh in the data science process because it includes statistics and um, data modeling and it's extremely beneficial for scientists that collect and analyze and interpret large amounts of data because machine learning makes it like easier and faster so like a hundred times faster than human brain and this is something that we'll need in the following year in the following years if you've been visiting you know uh, conferences um, uh, sustainability conferences for the last I would say five seven years uh, you're definitely familiar with the following trends that uh world food organization uh gives us but just go through them so you know that by 2015 the population is going to increase uh is going to increase and that production uh will grow by 60 percent so we'll need to produce 60 percent more food you know to to feed uh, nine billion of people uh, and um besides like the food demand increasing uh, and um, it means that the competition between companies is go food production companies is going to grow and the quality will be diminishing and the quantity will be uh, will be smaller and will need more natural resources it all means that we'll need to apply smarter smarter technology uh, for uh, agricultural management you know, to uh, save resources, to be more sustainable in order to uh, decrease uh, footprint, agricultural footprint is something that everybody fights right at the moment. And of course, the climate change, one of the things is a growing impact in agriculture. And another tendency, I would say, this is like the science and technology that comes out of those um, tendencies on the market this of course the development of science and technology as the main source of agricultural productivity because science and technology they are scalable they can uh, analyze uh, huge amounts of data, data which is like scattered between different sources and uh, that's why like we i mean when i'm saying we like octech companies like eos data analytics will been developing 
solutions and we are moving in this direction. You know that machine learning and uh, actually deep learning, like they are very um, widely used, but I would say this is not, we're just halfway, you know, to real decision support systems where we're moving to because uh, more than input suppliers, farmers, um, insurance companies, finance companies, food traders, they don't want to pay, you know, for just complicated data or complicated insights that they need to spend time to analyze that, uh, to analyze it and then make a decision. Because you understand that there is linear de dependency between the freshness of the data and the quality of the decisions that you make. And technology is actually help us to get up to date uh, insights and insights that are close to the decision making. And, and the faster we make decisions, the better quality we get, like the, the higher yields if we're talking about agriculture, higher yields we get and um, like better management strategies we get. So that's where we are moving to, you know, being able to process data quickly and get actionable insights that, that, that allow you to make like really fast and quality decisions. So, but all the companies and uh, EOS data analytics is on this way, you know, to uh, to create this uh, support decision system in the future. So that's where we are moving. That's why today we're talking about technology. Yeah. So artificial neural networks. Uh, they're used. Uh, they have like very good ability to recognize uh, objects in the imagery and um, like to differentiate differentiate uh, patterns, specific uh, feature recognition in the imagery, and that's where we use them. So, what challenges we, our company, uh, solve with the help of the neural nets? This is like land cover classification in order to dif differentiate w water from agricultural land, from art artificial objects, and others. The detection of clouds, yeah, so. Uh, you know that there is like um, satellites they do have pre-processing and they detect clouds but we have noticed that anyway the detection is not always really accurate that's why we decided to do our own algorithm and and put it into the our product in order you know to detect uh, clouds better because clouds really violate uh, NDVI or vegetation data indices that we get and this in the analytics that we get that's why like we also develop our algorithms for cloud detection this is crop type classification and tree uh, species classification uh, that we do A detection of harvested and flooded areas um, the future and that we were working at uh, this is the verification of diseases and uh, and past intelligence suite control. We're working on this. And uh, in the end, we're going to make decision-making support system where you can sim simulate and, um, uh, and model possible scenarios, you know, in order to make better decision based on that. So, and if talking about classification or and um, classification of crop types, uh, this is something that helps to you know, optimize and predict the market as, as expansions in case we're moving in the new areas. But we are going to talk about it in more details. So I'm not the person, you know, to talk um, in detail about like convolutional neural networks uh, or like the, their difference with like a fully connected network or something. I'm going to talk about case studies, but anyway, for better understanding, convolutional neural networks, that one that will work is to recognize different type of crops because um, they have like a capacity to uh, like pre to, they are very adaptable and they can process and analyze uh, huge amounts of data. In our cases, this is the time series of hundreds, sometimes thousands of images, satellite images from the past. And they like do this like pretty fast. They, um, another thing why we use them, uh, they're not really, not so sensitive to elimina elimination to some, um, 
a complex background, a size of the imagery. Uh, they require really specific and detailed data lab labeling. This is something, this is really hard work of our GIS specialists that, that need to label every piece uh, of the data like on the map. Uh, and uh, yeah, if talking just uh, at the really top high level, how networks, uh, how neural, neural networks work, let's imagine like a toddler when it tries, you know, to learn, uh, to learn what a dog is and what what is not. Um, he looks at really complex abstraction, which is a dog, yeah, and uh, sh this toddler trying to identify specific objects features that is related to this dog like kind of so there are hundreds of layers in our case you can see in this image like the layer number one layer number two so it starts identifying the nose specific nose specific eyes ears uh color uh specific color of the fur and the toddler points out to the dog and asks his mother okay is it a dog and if mother concern confirms that uh they understand that um when, when next see, next time toddler sees uh, uh, something similar to these features re that he recognized previously, he'll understand that this is a dog. But this is like just the first layer. Then he moves forward uh, and uh, understand, okay, what is a nose? Yeah, so of a dog, there are like two black holes, let's say, and there are specific uh, curves. Uh, specific uh, bumps on, on his nose that make the texture of this dog. So we, when we're talking about convolutional and neural networks, they learn from a pixel, yeah? So they they have, they just don't see something that our eye doesn't see, a complex hundreds of layers of data here in one single pixel. So, and it starts from a smaller, uh smaller number of pixels and then build up like next level picture uh like next next level feature out of these pixels and why i'm talking about this uh because um one of the advan um one of the challenges that face science that work with the neural nets that train them that teach them um this is lack um lack of data actually lack of training data data sets uh to to train the networks and that's where we're moving to so first uh first project that we had was classification of crop types all over ukraine the journey has started in 2016 when we won you know the tender of world bank uh, that we where we had to classify every single field in Ukraine and identify type of crop that was growing there. So uh, classify classify whole Ukraine means to classify 60 million hectares of the full area. You know, to first first of all classifying the land cover. It means to de detect and differentiate water from uh, um, agricultural lands, agricultural lands from arable lands, uh, mountains, forests, artificial objects. So kind of we do have map uh, with uh, all these um, uh, classes, classifying classes. Afterwards, when we classified like the agricultural land and differentiated it, uh, it, meant, it meant that we needed to classify 41 million hectares of agricultural lands. And um, actually, and besides that, we'll, we needed to uh, define the borders, to draw the borders of every field over these 41 million hectares of agricultural land. This is something that we did, that we have been doing, like starting from 10, 2016. And every year we do have uh, fresh data in order to uh like uh, fresh data on the crops that is growing in ukraine and our farmers and the government they have access to the transparent data uh, and they have the understanding how many hectares of corn and wheat is growing in this district or this uh or, or the region or the full country and everything something that makes um production analytics easier and more transparent but let's like have a closer look at this project what we have. 
yeah, as I mentioned, we have classified uh, the whole uh, area of Ukraine, uh, like land cover classification, defining like artificial objects from water, cropland, bare land, wetlands, arable lands, and everything. Next step was actually ground truth data collection, the most challenging part, because, you know, in order to make a neural networks work, first you need to train them. And that's where we need like very pure clean afterwards uh, in situ data, uh, ground truth data. So uh, let me, yeah, here we go. So every year, two, two times a year, we've been uh, planning our route to collect ground truth data. So this is just example of our screenshot of our planning ground, of, of the ground truth data collection from 2019. So you can see in summer and winter, we collect data for summer crops and for winter crops as well. So for example, in 2019, uh, our partners, uh, the scientists from the like, universities that we cooperate with, our uh, work, our like employees here at EUSDA, they uh, spent uh, in se seven uh, like they their way was planned for seven seven thousand kilometers. So. So that was their journey, you know, to collect all the possible points. And in winter, the route is um, a bit smaller, just one a thousand and a half uh, kilometers in order, like not all lands are pretty accessible in order to collect it. And uh, as you can see, like we do this all every year, and this is something that helps us to improve the accuracy data when coming up for 2020 and 2021. So we've talking about 2016, 17 years, um, the accuracy day of data was lower, uh, the classes that we class classified, I mean, the types of crop that, that we classified, they, we didn't have them all the time. So as you can see, uh, this is just an example. So kind of, uh, this is the number of points for every crop that we got from this route that we plan almost every year. And, um, and uh, yeah, so for example, in summer, in summer 2019, we collected 1,000 points for winter wheat. In summer 2020, uh, we collected uh, 115 points for, for spring wheat and or 600 points for winter barley. And then when we get back, we uh, our GIS department, this is most time consuming work and resource consuming work, and cost consuming work because you know to plan this route and everything it, it costs uh so in our gis department starts to label this data and uh, creating borders of the field and training the models so yeah so this is kind of example where you can see that uh along this route that we had uh the points of ground truth uh, data collection, that they, they are spread pretty evenly. And this is actually a requirement. When you collect ground truth data, you should smartly plan the route. You should smartly plan where you want to take those soil samples or just, uh, yeah, like on the way we were taking the soil samples, you know, because um, to have like better understanding um, of vegetation development in these areas in order you know to apply them in the modeling yeah so uh another example not related to ukraine but related to ground truth data collection that's something that we did with our partners in india when we were collecting data for uh, sugar cane uh, classification when we wanted to detect sugar cane meals in india so uh, in maharashtra um, region they were also planning the route classify them uh, like very, it was very thorough planning from like uh, specifying the road where they want to, they plan to go and where they're going to take those, uh, like pin, put the pinpoints and kind of get the ground truth data for, uh, for sugar cane. So the first step is to collect the ground truth data. And there are several rules uh, I already mentioned for like successful ground truth data collection. First of all, like the number of points that you collect or like polygons, right? Where you specify the crop is growing there. It should be at least one to 3% of the total number of fields 
that you want eventually, you know, to process. So kind of it was huge work, like when we were collecting the data over Ukraine, um, like that's why we couldn't do this like just one year. We've been collecting this data uh, every year. Um, the distribution of these points, as I mentioned, it should be it should be even, trying, you know, all over the route and uh, balance between the classes. When you're classifying crops, you should be, uh, it's always, um, helpful in terms of the accuracy when you have several classes, uh, not only like one class, I'll talk about like sugarcane in Brazil, the classification that we did, but sugarcane has really specific features. It's not like easy to confuse it, you know, with the corn, for example, because it's like multi-year culture and everything. But when we're talking about winter wheat, um, barley, or just uh, spring wheat, it's difficult to classify them, you know, to differentiate from each other. That's why it's important to have uh, as as many classes as you, okay, excuse me, as you can have. And uh, quality of this data. Yeah, like uh, you should process, you should clean this data after you get it, but this is the next step. So the input data, this is area of, of, area of interest. The uh, imagery from Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 for the whole year and ground truth data with the geometry. And uh, the next step is the preparation of the data sets. Uh, when uh, the team got back, while we're Q, like GIS specially started like labeling the data and uh, they like cleaned that from the duplicates uh, and trying to were like, and this is kind of monkey job, like manual job that you do. And this is nobody, nobody actually loves it. And it takes a lot of time but we, we needed like to do that. And uh, afterwards we did like data optimi optimization, like we cleaned it and it was ready, you know, to start training, to start training uh, the, the algorithm. So as an example, you can see, for example, this is example of the label of the labeling of uh, different types of crops. So those are fields, um, maybe somewhere in the Kherson Oblast, because I uh, can, as you can see, they are irrigated, like because they are round. So we can see here winter barley, uh, winter rapsid. So this is like kind of winter crop example of data labeling. And afterwards, like. You can see that we had several labeled fields. When we run the algorithm, we can like do, we can get the classification in the end. Yep. So and uh, when we did it, we got like crop classification map, and we get it like every year, starting from 2016. And you can specify like a region, for example, that you want to see, and it will tell you like how many hectares um, of corn, sunflower, maize, uh, soybeans, rapeseed is growing there, there uh, and here and there. So it's kind of very helpful at the governmental level and um, to understand, you know, uh, the availability of crops here, there, but also it's very important like on the farm level and I'm going to show you. Uh, let me just switch, share my screen. Okay, I want to show you that on the platform because it's actually there on the platform. Uh, can you, Kata, can you please let me know if you can, uh, if you can see my screen in the chat, in our chat, because I don't see the chat right now. Yeah, right, you can see. You can see my screen that I'm sharing, right? Yeah, good. So uh, this is the crop monitoring. I'm not going to show you like <laughs> the, the whole platform, just the crop classification map. Here in the crop monitoring, we do have this crop classification map. So here is, here is Ukraine. And if we just zoom in a little bit, you can, in any part of Ukraine, you just zoom in, and you get this crop classification up. So you can see that every field is, is separated from each other. So we did border detection, uh, analyzing uh, like field, analyzing the imagery, um, using also time series algorithm, not really neural networks, but, but still like to classify the borders of those fields. And you can see, so here you can uh, click between, um, you can switch, uh, change the season, like for 2020, 2020, 
you can see some data is missing because every year we were improving and improving our algorithms. For example, that's how it looked in 2017. We can we only had six, six classes, and uh, some fields, you know, were uh, classified. Some some fields were not classified because we were just having six classes in 2017 but in 2021 we already have more than 15 classes of different crops and when you point out to this field here is like corn is growing sunflower um what else soybean yeah what is wheat so you can see those fields are completely classified and what makes it easier for our farmers when they just click on this field they just select add a field and they can add it to their account so mm, let me just for example how it looks at the field level when you press here show more you can see the crop rotation data starting from 2017 um sunflower or wheat then in 2019 sugar beet was growing here and in 2021 wheat was growing here like the data for 2020 is missing for a different reason maybe nothing was growing there maybe like some kind of crop was growing there that we were not classifying and it's just other crop you know um yep so that's that's how it looks like it's useful at the country level region scale level let me get back to the presentation here we go. Yeah, and for the every farmer in uh, particular. Besides that, on top of that, like uh, for, for, for some selected user, the one that we can apply cadastral map uh, and they can, uh, like an insurance companies or bank companies or government organizations, they sometimes need this data. So we can apply cadastral map and they can work with the cadastral unit and know what kind of crop is growing there. So yeah, that's what I was showing on the platform. It's pretty actionable, dynamic. You can click it and, and everything. And you can get access, you know, to crop rotation data from 2016. Mm -hmm. And this is, I think, the most interesting part about the accuracy of crop classification. Yeah, so um, that's something, this is the accuracy from 2021 already. You can see that's, that's pretty uh, fair accuracy that, that we show. Um, and for example such uh, crops as flax oat millet uh poppy they're not really easy like you know to recognize so uh for those who know there is like confusion matrix and they sometimes are confused with other with other crops and uh that's why the accuracy for them is not high but for such crops so this is 100 percent scale it means like the accuracy that we got uh, yeah, forest is here, like mill, uh, maize, grassland, garden, rapeseed, um, soya, and uh, spring rapeseed, sunflower, sugar beet, uh, in this case, like wine yard, uh, wetlands, winter rapeseed, winter wheat, winter barley, um, buckwheat, uh, and other alfalfa. They have pretty, pretty high uh, level of accuracy that, that we got here. So for some types of crops, the accuracy is pretty high. Yep. So as 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 I mentioned, like uh, getting this data at different at different scales, you know, at the field field level, which is really helpful for cost, uh, farmers because they have access to the crop rotation data or insurance organizations or, or the, the want to manage their risk or banks that provide agricultural loans. They have access to this crop rotation data and which make the process, the whole process really transparent because you understand if the uh, if farmer has sown the type of crop that he previously mm, uh, requested in his request. And uh, so it's like important to conduct regional inventories 
and just to access the vegetation condition conditions and like estimate the potential yield and uh, forecast crop availability in some specific in, in, in regions or areas and just plan you know the logistics supplies and other stuff and this is like important for transparency from the government perspective to understand what kind of crop is actually sowing here or there and important for development of management de database um, and uh, of course it's something that is important for traders that want to know where where what kind of crop uh, is where located and where is the biggest uh hectare of maize of maize or wheat is growing and especially it might be useful uh when you understand how to build your closer to what roads is located sometimes upon a request we can make you know analytics of these fields uh like in case they have like task to see how it's related with the logistics that they built yep okay so this is a, this is it about the case in ukraine that we actually had i'm ready to answer your questions and then we'll go to the sugar cane classification in brazil let me check what kind of questions we have yeah let me um so um I'm writing from agrostavia.com, the main Colombian research center in agriculture. Do you have satellite data on Colombia? Uh, yeah, satellite data that we that we use in our researches. This is open source data from Sentinel-2, which is 10, 10 meter resolution for some researches. Uh, for some projects, we use uh, uh, not optical data, but radar data from Sentinel-1. So uh, the satellite scans all, all the world and kind of yeah we do have this data and we're like satellite data from all our partners with high resolution commercial data so um if you're looking for some specific data you can reach out to, to us at uh, sales at eosda.com and we'll just provide you more information on that yeah uh, mm -hmm. Is there any articles published using your service, especially the cloud computing applications in uh, agriculture? No, I cannot recall it because I don't think we like publish them publicly. But again, like uh, write us and uh, and uh, like me or my colleagues will check with the scientific department if we have something you know to share. Um, uh, what any material about this presentation? Uh, yeah like all the materials we'll send after the presentation if the uh, after this webinar you'll get it like within an hour or something so no worries uh other articles where you can refer uh, to use as references all the uh you know uh, articles and materials that i used to prepare this presentation are there in the presentation um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay are there any advantages for using neural networks instead of random forest method for land cover for uh, for land cover classification? Uh, a very uh, a neural networks are very computationally intensive, and random forest seems to deliver of uh, 0.95 accuracy anyway. Um, like actually, we use both of those methodologies uh, and ra and random forest as well. So both of them work for land cover classification. I wouldn't say that the classes for land cover are really specific and they are diff difficult you know, to define some patterns in them. So both of those uh, methodologies work here. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, I can see somebody complimenting me. Thank you, Juan. Um, any plans to support Sentinel now 5p anytime soon um i think i i like i haven't heard any either like um i i haven't heard that we're going to support it soon but yeah of course we always try to uh be like keep staying up to date and yeah i, I think yes um do you consider weather condition and variability of the season uh for we do consider you know crop when we're talking about classification 
we do consider a crop calendar for specific countries, you know, like uh, the dynamic of the development in order to understand um, like for yeah, like an additional layer. Uh, yeah, but uh, weather conditions, no, no, not in the crop classification, in yield prediction or some predictive modeling, yes, of course. Um, okay, okay, yeah. I think that's it. Another portion, or another portion of questions I'll answer when we stop next next time. So sugar cake classification in Brazil. Okay, where it started. First of all, we have two challenges. The first challenge: detection of sugarcane mills in Brazil and detect the harvested statues of sugarcane. If you know, uh, sugarcane is multi-year culture and it can be harvested several times a year. And this is important in order to understand, you know, the sugarcane availability. It's important to understand how many hectares have been uh, harvested in order, you know, to predict uh, somehow the biomass. Uh, of, of sugar cane harvested. So how it started? So it was in San Paulo state in Brazil. Uh, we got almost 1 million hectares of sugar cane uh, data, ground truth data, I mean, where sugar cane is located. And we divided this that million uh, hectares into training set and validation set, like so part of the data we used for training and then we validated that. So um, we approached, since it was like pretty new for us, uh, challenge like classifying the sugarcane, we tried different methodologies and approaches to that. So we used the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data, as you know, in, um, and, and uh, also uh, MODIS, like Terra MODIS data uh, as well because uh, uh, sometimes the data was missing and as you know convolutional neural networks I I'm not sure if you know but, but still they um, like not so sensitive sensitive to missing data and uh, that's why like and we were combining sentinel one sentinel two and terra modis and we tried different ap approaches so we were trying uh, we were we were trying uh, to use uh, just set of channels you know Set uh, combination of bands to detect the sugar cane. Then we were trying using indices in order to uh, detect sugar cane, sugar cane. But actually, overall, in uh, accuracy that we got was just uh, a combination of channels or a combination of vegetation indices was pretty low. It's like was now more than 17%. So we moved forward. And we decided to try a convolutional LSTM model, uh, which is pretty uh, complicated. But, uh, but the thing is, like, was that we um, built uh, the trend um, time, time stamp of, of more than a year of data in order, you know, to detect sugar cane. It's it's pretty uh, complicated. It's pretty complicated. Uh, so, but in the end like we uh, understood that this uh, model showing like more than 90 percent overall accuracy actually like we got nine um, yeah 94 94 percent of overall accuracy at detecting sugarcane in brazil since uh, the fields the mills in brazil are pretty uh, big you know like large and there is no difficulty with 10 meter resolution to find boundaries of those sugar uh, sugar cane meals when talking about india one of the challenges there that their fields are really small and they are kind of narrow you know and they are about one hectare so applying this 10 meter resolution for those mills is actually challenging but not for brazil where like uh, fields are like about 70 80 sometimes 30 hectares or one, more than 100 so it, it really depends and uh, so w when doing our research we come up to the conclusion that the most informative spectral bands for the indication of sugar cane uh, is sentinel-2 so this resolution and the frequency of the data is enough you know to get this 94 uh, percent of accuracy uh, simple methods of satellite data uh, segmentation like band combinations or uh, channel combinations or uh, combin or indices they just don't work for sugarcane detection um, and the most uh, uh, working way to detect this is using like convolutional LSTM uh, model like 
convolutional neural networks. The challenge too that we had afterwards, you know, okay, we have detected sugarcane fields. Um, we have detected the borders of those sugarcane fields. And another next challenge was to detect uh fields and the dates when they were completely harvested not harvested or partially harvested like specifying the percentage uh of the fields and the date when it was harvested so we kind of we um it was forty-seven thousand of hectares it's like were about five or six and um six thousand uh fields where we were classifying not necessarily when we were detecting the harvested indexes, like uh, what is the percentage of harvest uh, of this field was harvested. So uh, what we're doing, we were providing reports every seven, 10 days, uh, like usually it was 10 days because the frequency of the data um, allows us to get better, uh, better results and accuracy. You know, the frequency of the Sentinel is about five days. Uh, it depends and and, the, and uh, there is a risk of cloud so we decided to do this reports every 10 days so every 10 days we will provide in report field level reports showing that uh, for example on, on may uh, 27th um 100 fields have been harvested with this statue so you know fully harvested partially harvested and not so we were using like specific uh technology which is able using radar satellite data and uh, in dvi time series to detect whether like the field was uh, whether the field was harvested so and in the end the customer got uh this kind of um if they opened us in their js system so you can see different fields sugarcane meals and the color means the date when harvested happened yeah so uh and we got like around 93 percent of accuracy for uh, detection of harvest of uh, harvested fields there yeah so that was about sugar cane and before we go to the forest uh uh to like reproduction and detection of the first station of harvested areas let me see if we have any questions here. Okay. 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 I'm just, uh, excuse me, I'm just a bit lost because uh, it's good, but do you? Okay. So, question from Kristen. Um, NDVI is good, but do you consider to? working in companion with another one i wasn't uh, uh kristen i wasn't talking about in dvi like we're not using indices uh, for crop classification for crop classification so we're using neural nets um okay th this is just a big picture of the application uh, my question is how you guys are using a neural network to train data yeah so uh the webinar I'm, I'm talking more about you know the case studies that we had with the neural networks if you wanna uh if you want to uh let, let let's say if, if if you want to know like more details about neural net like how would how we train them just reach out to, to us i'll try the scientific team you know to share some details okay um how do you deal? Okay, when you are calculating in DVI or when or other vegetation index, how do you deal with shadows? You mean the shadows from the clouds? Um, that was like even if not talking about you know in DVI, but talking about um, neural networks. Clouds is actually a big makes a big impact, you know, and violates the data that that you get uh, in the end. So we do this manually yeah like not all the like first of all we run the algorithm to detect all the possible clouds and then yeah we just our js special is to make data more reliable or reliable training data sets we just manually look through them sometimes we even do this yeah uh i need to have it seems that you need to have ground date this is not a question uh juan Manuel is asking, uh, would it be possible to do that kind of crop classification in Mexico with your support in order to digitize our agriculture? 
Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, like we do not have any uh, limitations in terms of the uh, where to work in, in, in the world, like satellite data is available everywhere. So we'll need access, we'll, we'll need some data, access to ground truth data and collect it, something that we did in India. So we have hired partners in the area that where we need it and they were collecting uh, the data. We were helping them to create a route to collect those ground truth samples. And yeah, uh, afterwards we can train the model, we can run it and we can classify it at the, at the country scale. Uh, okay, let me see what else we have. Um, Peter is saying, how was classification precision how how was classification precision affected when you apply train algorithm outside of region of interest? How is tra transferability of learn model? Can you can uh, you use uh, ah, can you use it in the other regions countries or have to be retained on region data? Uh, very good question. Actually, like when I when I ask it, when I ask this question to our scientific department, of course they always say. When you start with a new region, you have to train the model from the from the scratch. It's always better to gain better accuracy. You need to train it from the scratch, with uh, considering that uh, weather conditions are different, crop calendar is different, development of the crops is different, and it's better to train it from the end. But actually, we were trying to, to experiment with that, and for example, we tried to apply. Uh, an algorithm that we use for sugarcane classification in Brazil, uh, apply it to India. And uh, the accuracy, uh, to be honest, it wasn't high. Like before we got ground truth data, it, it wasn't high because India has its own specifics. The, the fields are really small uh, the, and, and they are long. Sometimes they're even less than, than you know, one hectare or something. And uh, crop calendar is totally different. So the accuracy was low, and however, but when we are what uh, like using ground truth data uh, of that we got from India uh, and uh, applied and trained the model using that ground truth data, we got better accuracy. But for example, if talking about the model that we use in Ukraine, and then we applied it to applied it to like similar crops, for example, in uh, Eastern Europe, I mean like uh, or Kazakhstan. Um, that are pretty close. Uh, so yeah, we, we got like pretty high accuracy and we applied, yeah, we applied that in Canada, for example. And yeah, it, we also got, got pretty high accuracy for uh, like wheat, canola, rapsid. So some kind of models, it's like, it's a lot to experiment, you know, to, to try to apply the algorithm that you have to other regions. But of course, it's better to have the training sets for that. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing this information uh, with us. Uh, we are working with cacao and prawn satellite images in LATAM. Could you please share some of the research works that you have used on or based the development? Some research work that you have used, uh -huh. you mean in the Latin America? Uh, if we consider Brazil to be Latin America, so yeah, we, do, we did have their like uh, this sugarcane classification. If you're interested in, in like in something specifically, we have many customers in Latin America that use in crop monitoring. Um, yeah, so if you're if you're interested in some specific crop, just reach out to that to us. Like our specialist will contact you and will like show our previous experience uh, with customers from uh, Latin America, like. Uh, Argentina, um, Brazil, uh, Paraguay, Uruguay, and other countries. Um, okay, what devices did you use in the manual data collection? Good question, but I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I remember like some software, like open source software uh, for like this geographical dots collection. Um, yeah. Okay, who are your partners in India? I don't think that, uh, that I can name them, but they are just JS, uh, uh, Department of JS specialists, like nothing, uh, and uh, agronomists, you know, that, that just help us collect the data all over India. 
Uh, yeah, let's move forward. Okay, so uh, let's start with the uh, the same like neural nets we use to detect deforested areas. And uh, like one of the case studies that we had and where it actually started that we decided to develop our own platform, that the case was the Australian uh, company, for uh, food, forest management company, uh, somewhere at the Tesla Tasmania Island. So they wanted to get monthly reports, progression reports on their harvested, harvesting works. They are really, this company is really about sustainability. And every month they harvest around 3,000 hectares. But still, it was a challenge for, for them, you know, to uh, get every month uh, data how many hectares have been harvested because their blocks, forest blocks, are spread all over Tasmania. And uh, they decided to use our technology in order to detect uh, harvested areas and get reports every month. Yeah, one of the challenges were clouds and sometimes, and uh, that's where we used radar technology that penetrates clouds and we are able, you know, to detect harvested areas there. So let me show you uh, on the real examples, how forest, oh, okay, I need to switch first, right, to show in sharing my screen. Oh, here we go. Yeah, forest monitoring, let me get back. I'll select one demo stand and I'll show you just real example how it actually works. Yeah, so here you can see this is one demo stand uh, somewhere in Australia and uh, um, the, we don't use in DVI here. So this is not based on the indices, you know, those symbols ones. So this is um, uh, first layer, this is forest cover that detects the parts where forest is. And in order to make sure that it works right, we need to make it uh, transparent. Here we go. So when I'm making this transparent, the other way, right? Uh, you can see uh, on the natural color that the forest uh, parts, uh, the trees are, are still here. So the neural net detects where forests are and it says you, okay, so in this stand, 15 hectares are still in place. Then the interesting part is happening here in the deforestation level. The deforestation level works on the monthly and quarterly basis. So we can select the period of time we're interested in to see uh, the parts of the stand that have been harvested. Yeah, so for example, let me, I know that the stand uh, we monitor this as a quarterly basis. For example, let's get back to Q2 in 2021. What it means, it takes uh, the last image of Q2 and compares it to the last image available in Q1 in order to see what difference has happened between those images and of course if you take like um uh like want to compare months it will take the last image of july for example and will compare it to the last image of june in order to provide you um information of the part that ha has been deforestated so what we can see here in red highlighted the part that has been deforestated it says us that seven more than seven hectares ha have been harvested let's check it make it transparent and you can see. So this small part of the stand has been already harvested, but here you can see the forest, right? And we're moving forward and we want to select Q3, for example. Yeah, since this is not just in DVI, this is like neural nets working in real time. It sometimes takes time, you know, to analyze it. Here we go. So it says that in Q3, this part has been harvested. So yeah, when I apply uh, transparency, transparency, here uh, you can see that really, like this part has been harvested in Q2 and this part has been harvested in Q3. So nine hectares uh, has been harvested now. And we're go when we're going to Q4, let me just, yep, Q4. So, and we 
Okay, so this small part, like three hectares, has been harvested in U4, right? So you can see this from the transparency thing. So it disappeared. And uh, yeah, so, and when we go to the dashboard thing, that's the place where all your stands that you have are kept and you you can select a period here so i want to see all uh changes that happened in q4 2021 to my stands right and let's wait a bit because i have many stands in here yeah so for example i can see that in q4 comparing to q3 for example in this us demo stand 121 hectares has been harvested and um, yeah for example uh, like my some uh, here our stand in australia three hectares have been harvested and you can download this report and share it with the colleagues and here it shows you what kind of images have been compared between them between each other yeah so uh, in this case it was comparing uh, imagery from september 25th with the imagery from the december 24th so the last available imagery cloudless imagery there and last uh, cloudless imagery in Q4. And it means then 62% of the whole stand uh, that we have has been harvested in, Q, in Q2. So yeah, let me get back to my presentation. Yeah, here we go. Yeah. So that's something that I showed you uh, in as a real example in the real time using uh, using forest monitoring our platform and here what you can see you know in, in the presentation so it detects you know the forest areas and it detects like the deforestated parts yeah uh that's what i was talking about you know cloud detection we uh, use our own algorithm in crop monitoring and forest monitoring to detect clouds in order not to violate in dbi data that we get in the end and yeah that's that's pretty it like where where we're uh moving um and uh yeah well, we're we've been developing this technology for the last seven years and uh like we released forest monitoring which is using neural networks like analyzing the data uh actually on the fly and providing you with uh, reports and that's where we're moving we'll be developing this technology and uh, yeah, like just releasing it as ready-made products, as ready-made pipelines, you know, to automate it, to make it, to make them scalable, uh, to make them actionable. So yeah, that's pretty it. It's been an hour I've been talking. <laughs> so let me see if I if we have any questions, additional questions. I'll answer them, and I can let you go. Uh... Okay, one is asking, I'm very interested in to teach the satellites by drones, improving uh, GSD, what you experience with uh, neural networks. Um, the thing is like, uh, so far, since we have challenges at really global scale, you know, regional scale, uh, not always field scale, like satellite data is the best uh, option here because uh, drone data, of course, it has better accuracy. It has like 0.5, 0.3 meter um resolution uh, and uh, neural networks can be applied to that but at the like very small farm scale or, or something but not the region scale or global scale challenges um why pomegranate data why pomegranate data is not visible in india and if i shows it as barren land oh very interesting um i cannot to tell for sure right now just email us send, send us the example with the coordinates and we'll check it um are, the, are these demonstrated right now special features on eos i don't see them on mine uh hi Dern. nice to nice to meet you here um ha happy that you joined uh, no those are not special features you have access to all features as uh, other paid users of our crop monitoring mm, maybe you haven't seen the forest monitoring if you're interested in forest monitoring just let me know i'll provide you with the trial access and and anybody if somebody wants the access trial access to crop monitoring or forest monitoring just drop us a line at sales at eos.com or at support at uh, eosda.com and we'll provide you with a trial so you can check it 
um, can the deforestation interval be shortened from monthly to 10 days as it's as is currently done for crop monitoring um, there is uh, you can um, request custom uh, custom uh, adjustment so please just explain us why you need it why 10 days is more important uh, to you why monthly statistics is not enough and we'll figure out if it's possible because it, it really depends on uh, the the region where the location i mean uh, country uh, where your forest located because so, sometimes we we're using sentinel to to data and if it might probably really area that is covered with clouds or it's been an hour and i'm just stuck with some words in my head um and if, if the area is very cloudy there so we need to check it first of all and then we can tell if it's possible to make it 10 day but not uh, one month uh okay i'll i'll appreciate the material um mm -hmm. Uh, hundreds of concerns are born, like detection of deforestation areas, interspecies classifications, and so on. Yeah, you're welcome. All the materials you'll get lie right at the webinar. Uh, crop classification, a special feature, seem to be a special feature. Crop classification, yeah, if, uh, yeah, Burns, I get you what you're asking. Yeah, crop classification is not something that is in the platform, you know, or just out of box thing. It's a custom project project-based that requires project-based approach. So what we did, we only did it like uh, for Ukraine and it's now available in the crop monitoring because like that was the project um, uh, finance, financed by uh, World Bank and we did it like, uh, but if, if you need like separate crop classification, it should be ordered and discussed separately. Yeah, so it's, it's not in the, in the product um okay can you can you suggest any tool for data collection um yeah please uh email me or email support or sales and uh yeah i'll, I'll tell you what kind of tools we used for data collection i don't remember it at the moment um is drone imagery better alternative to cloud cleaned satellite imagers drone imagery is actually mm, never is actually never an alternative to satellite imagery i would say they complement satellite imagery right um because um yeah so the, the difference is like drone imagery they are just more for local usage you know but but they cannot see the global picture because it takes it takes you several days to fly over i don't know one hundred thousand hectares and they just and then process this imagery and uh, what we're talking about that there is linear dependency between the freshness of the data you get and the quality of the decision that you make. And drones is something that is missing because you need some time to process the data that you get from the drones and you need some time to fly over the areas and everything. So uh, drones are good, you know, for some spot uh, problems, uh, you know, when you can send it and it checks uh, the disease. But I'm not sure mm, it's really, it, it's really costy if you use it, you know, to, for class, crop classification or something. And so uh, satellite imagery and drones, they just solve totally different kind of challenges. But of course, if it were possible to get like quick uh, uh, and uh, quick fly over uh, plenty of hectares when, with 0.3 resolution, of course, the better resolution is always better result. Um, okay, uh, you mentioned that you didn't use non-vegetation indices and the analysis it means that you use only rgb image data in crop classification um used only rgb image data i mean like um we didn't use uh indices as a combination of bands so yeah in this thing yes we used rgb uh, rgb channels uh like like neural nets are working with that to classify to you know to define so certain per patterns of specific crops um perhaps a special specifically we can get access to soil data chemical physical data and also a tomb cycle for sugar crane crop uh 
Uh, yeah, like we're, we're using, weren't using that for classification, but for yield prediction or uh, biomass estimation, yeah, it's totally possible to use. How long does it take to process image images using this beautiful platform? If you were talking about the platform, seconds, one, one second, uh, yeah, it's just, it, it really works on the fly. You just, you just put your field there and you get satellite data and insights right like on the spot okay i think thank you very much for your participation for listening to me i hope you found it fi uh, helpful in case you have some questions reach out to us we have plenty of specialists that can uh, have a you know a call with you to tell you everything to show specific cases to don't to upload your field into the platform or your forest stand into to forest monitoring platform and show you how it works yeah, uh, all the materials you will get right after the webinar. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a great day, evening. Bye.